you know, we, we empower communities, uh, the way we bring connections to individuals. Uh, and in fact, he's going to be sharing a little bit around his strategy uh, and the way that he is innovating uh, and, and really helping to, to build out a network uh, globally uh, for Fulbright alumni around the world. Um, so if you move to the next slide real quick, I will uh, just give you a quick agenda for today. Uh, we're going to do some introductions. There's three primary presenters uh, today. Uh, you'll meet us formally in just a minute. Uh, we're going to do a quick overview of Hivebrite. Of course, everyone here on the uh, webinar today uh, is likely an admin on the platform or has some experience in the platform, but uh, just a quick snapshot of where we are, where we see ourselves uh, as, as a company uh, and as a platform. And then we'll dive a little bit further into groups. Uh, how do groups function? What does it mean within the context of the Hivebright platform? Um, but fundamentally, the focus of today is around the group admin. What is a group admin? How do we identify them? How do we empower those group admins? Uh, and we're really going to take you along a journey of how that works. Um, and of course, um, you know, share that content with you afterwards to ensure that you have those takeaways to be successful following this webinar. Um, but I think really the meat uh, and potatoes of today's webinar is going to be around the, the Fulbright case study. So we're lucky enough to have Rob Ellis here with us today. Uh, he is going to be walking through his process, uh, walking through uh, kind of his thinking uh, and his strategy that he put into the platform uh, before launching. And then, of course, he will uh, toggle into his live environment and show you exactly how he's operating within the hybrid platform today. We'll leave a little bit of time at the end for Q&A and next steps. Uh, of course, we have the ongoing Q&A. Don't hesitate uh, to send a message through that Q&A panel uh, through the webinar link. So I haven't had a chance to introduce myself. Uh, some of you uh, may know me. Uh, we may have spoken before. My name is Kyle O'Brien. I am the head of customer success here at Hivebright. Uh, I'm based in our Paris office, but I moved here from New York. Uh, so for those of you who are based in the US, uh, good to hear from you. For those of you in Europe, uh, I'm just next door. So hopefully I'll have a chance to get on site and spend a little bit of time with you. Rob, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, there we go. Hey guys. Um, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Robert Pauls. I'm working out of our Chicago office, uh, um, working with Hivebrite since 2018, but uh, working as a community manager with Hivebrite uh, on a 40,000 community uh, in the nonprofit space since about 2016. So glad to work with you today. And Rob and Ellis. Ellis, you want to introduce yourself? Yep. So my name is Rob Ellis, and as Carl said, I'm the digital community manager for the new Fulbrighter global community platform. My background is in higher education, marketing and alumni engagement. And I've also worked in a range of digital content roles. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here today to share some of the successes and some of the challenges we faced in the rollout of Fulbrighter. Great, thanks so much. All right, well, without further ado, I think we will dive right into the content of today's webinar. So, as I mentioned, I wanted to give a quick uh, kind of at-a-glance view of Hivebrite. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as an all-in-one community platform. At Hivebrite, we really try to unlock the potential of communities. Uh, and we do that uh, through a couple of methods. One is by providing uh, you know, powerful admin capabilities. We really pride ourselves on flexibility and customization within the platform. Uh, but simultaneously, it's important for us to uh, really enable those end-user experiences, create dynamic branding and uh, rich and engaging content uh, and, and uh, abilities within the platform as a front end user uh, to make connection, uh, to identify with their community and, and find the information that they're looking for. And so when we think of communities, I think historically, um, you know, we, we thought of really two layers here. There's the, the admins who are uh, managing the platform, the, the project leaders of the, of the community, and you have the end users who are logging into the community, finding one another, um, they're usually there for a particular mission or, or purpose or uh, identity. Um, but in reality, I think there's a middle layer uh, that we actually haven't talked about all that much. And that middle layer is really the subject of today's conversation. Today's conversation is around group admins. Um, group admins uh, are a really incredibly important resource uh, within your community. And if you figure out how to identify them, how to leverage them, uh, and how to empower them, uh, you can take your community uh, to the next level. So let's review quickly what are groups. As most of you know, the Hivebrite platform has uh, tons of functionality. 
Uh, but one of the most popular pieces of, of, the, uh, of the platform is the group functionality. We like to think of it as uh, a miniature Hivebrite within Hivebrite. It's essentially a sub-network uh, where you can take uh, your global set of users and put them into a smaller category, whether that's based on affiliation, interest, uh, geography. Uh, there are tons of different ways that you can delineate uh, group uh, capabilities within the platform. Um, but essentially, it's, it's really powerful because you can build miniature or small communities of practice uh, that bring users together around a particular topic. Um, you can also take global functionality and house it within the group. So for example, the live feed, the forum, the directory, all of these features that exist at the global level can also be contained within the group level, uh, which gives you really powerful functionality at a granular level. Um, we also enable group admins to import and manage users. Uh, and of course, send group level communication. So uh, it really does kind of uh, can be treated as a, as a version of Hivebrite within Hivebrite. Uh, and we're really excited to talk about um, how you can leverage this functionality, but not only the functionality, um, how you can empower those group admins uh, to extend your reach within the community and, and create a more engaging and dynamic environment within the Hivebrite platform. So what exactly is a group admin? Uh, a group admin is no different from one of your global admins or an admin at your organization. The only difference is that they have control exclusively within a group inside of the platform. Uh, so a, a global administrator like Rob Ellis on today's call, he has the ability to see everything. Um, but a group admin is really dedicated to a, a group that they have ownership or control over. Um, they can be an internal resource. So if you have a number of people working on your project uh, internally, maybe you designate one as a group admin who has control over a specific area. Um, but they can also be external resources. They can be uh, people that are regularly logging into your platform, people who have self-selected as uh, champions or advocates of your mission or organization. Um, and that's really what we want to talk about today. How can we find uh, these individuals? How can we extend privileges out to them so that they can behave uh, like community managers at the group level? Um, and then how can you train them and ensure that they are uh, really behaving like an extension uh, of, of your global organization? How can they create content, moderate, uh, engage? Uh, how can they become uh, you know, subject matter experts or natural leaders within that private environment? Um, so it's very important that not only do you select the right people, but you empower them and align them with your global mission. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So let's first talk about like why we want to recruit group admin. So oftentimes many communities, regardless of their size, will start off with a single admin model, a hub and smoke, a hub and spoke model, if you will. And that's fine because uh, that's the easiest way to stand up a community's operations. And it works as communities move through their early pilot phases and also when community sizes are generally smaller. Uh, but at some point as the operations of your community deepen or as the size of your community expands, the bandwidth required to maintain this space inevitably exceeds the output of one community manager. It's hard to be everything to everyone in the community. And so we often see that uh, natural communities naturally evolve towards what's known as a snowflake model, which allows community managers to delegate leadership to subordinate groups of individuals within the larger community. This is a structure that serves communities regardless of their purpose or context, but don't take just our word for it. It was something that's also been successfully um, used, excuse me, uh, sorry for the malfunction. It's also been successfully used by the Obama campaign and Airbnb in supporting get up the vote efforts, as well as uh, mobilizing uh, their hosts for local uh, support of legislation. And so why should you consider adopting more of a snowflake model and delegating leadership to group admins? So let's look at some of the benefits of pursuing this approach. First off, let's be clear about something. The leaders who can serve as group admins in your community likely already are users right now in your community. Kyle will delve a little bit later into how you can identify the natural leaders, uh, but right now it's worth noting that these natural leaders already have the desire to step up within your community, lead engagement in these smaller sub-communities by simply identifying and tapping them to fulfill this role, you're gonna enable existing resources for content creation. Um, beyond that, uh, along those same lines, the additional support you have for posting content also means there's additional support you have for detecting user posted content that is in need of perhaps moderation or responding to. But beyond supporting your role, 
This creates value for, um, throughout the community all the way down to the user level. And so as Kyle mentioned, the genesis for a group could be a user's desire for local engagement, let's say engagement within the industry group, or even engagement around a transient project. Wherever a critical mass of your user exists around a particular focus, there's an opportunity to heighten their connection and engagement through a hive bright group. Groups are fantastic ways that large communities can enable hyper-focused connections and engagement for all its users. Uh, and more than that, uh, the successful implementation is essential for the health and longevity of a larger community. So focus groups also allow CMs or community managers rather to not only have a greater ability to engage with those users through the focus content, but also to market and recruit your community to outside individuals who may have affinity um, for, that, uh, for that group's focus. Along those same lines, the same is true for partners. Whether it be opportunities or events or content creation for that group, Focus group admins are the best uh, equipped individuals to bring in value from outside partners around their group's focus. Once established, uh, you'll soon have a circle of group admins with which you can foster a tight and candid feedback loop to ensure that you're gaining insight on your community's responses to content and opportunities. And the bottom line is that group admins help you deliver value to your users. And in return, people who get value from something often share about their value uh, gained with others as well. And the earned adv advocacy for your community through successful implementation uh, of the delegated leadership model will strengthen your community from the ground up. Fantastic, that's, that's great, Rob. Uh, I, I think uh, really just to summarize here, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, we, we understand uh, what, it, what, a, what the community platform is. We understand what a group is. Uh, we understand how group admins work and essentially the strategy behind uh, developing uh, and curating your group admins within the platform. But I think uh, what's really important to understand now is uh, how exactly do we do that? Um, and what you'll see is that uh, it's incredibly important to, to build a, a hierarchy and make a distinction between your global community managers and your group admins. Uh, we've talked quite a bit in the past uh, several minutes uh, around uh, essentially what a group admin is. Um, but I think it's fundamental to, to really set that definition up front. What is a community manager and what do they do? Uh, obviously, there can be different definitions for different communities, depending on the size, the scope, the industry. But ultimately, community managers have a, a ton of different responsibilities from content creation to communications, engagement strategies, and data management. Um, and that is quite a lot of work to do. Uh, not all of it is going to be done within the Hivebrite platform, in fact. We uh, think of ourselves as uh, an enablement tool for community managers to get the best out of their community online and in person. But with all that responsibility, it's important to delegate, and delegating requires individuals. Um, those individuals, again, the centerpiece of today's conversation, are group admins. Um, as I mentioned before, they can be internal or external, and they can help you to build strategies. They can get closer to those uh, focus groups within your community. Uh, they can provide that feedback loop um, and they can really become your eyes and ears on the ground within the community uh, to help you uh, build advocacy uh, and, and expand your growth and your reach uh, within your, your, your member base. So the last thing I want to touch on is uh, the why. Um, and, and why exactly are we doing this? Well, there, there's a lot of benefits to doing this. Um, and, and again, I, I've touched on a lot of them already. I, I want to explain to you a, a simple three-step process, and it's not that simple, as you can tell. There's uh, several kind of subcategories uh, under each one of these uh, each one of these uh, segments here. Uh, but if you break it down into three different segments, it's identifying, training, and then delegating. Um, the identify phase is is early on. Uh, who are these potential users? Uh, who are these potential group admins? Oftentimes, uh, they're the power users that exist within your community already. And so what we like to do, and I don't want to get too technical here, uh, is, is leverage a tool called engagement scoring. Uh, engagement scoring is a tool that you can find in your admin panel or back office where you can associate point values with certain actions that take place inside of the community. By doing so, you can add an emphasis to behaviors that you see value in. And over time, can start to track who is engaging in the behavior that you want. By doing that, you can actually filter to the top those power users that have a high propensity to be a good group admin. 
Once you've built those scoring parameters and tracked the users over a period of time, you can actually reach out to those potential champions, those potential group admins, uh, and determine whether or not they want to participate uh, on a more in engaged level uh, with the community as a whole. Now, what's really important, and I think this is something that Rob Ellis uh, from Fulbright will speak to, is training them. It's not just giving them permissions and saying, go to town. It's really building a training program, uh, hosting webinars like this, building out documentation, uh, sharing best practices, and, and, and kind of establishing a mission uh, for those group admins is critical. Um, so it's in, you know, really critical that you in, ensure uh, that you, you set goals uh, and, and limitations on what they can and cannot do inside of the platform uh, and really uh, set the tone for what, the, what you want them to accomplish. And then lastly, again, more from a technical perspective is around defining the permissions you want to provision. Um, inside of Hivebright, you have the ability to delineate access uh, and, and permissions uh, within the platform. Uh, do you want them to have all the rights as a group admin, some of the rights as a group admin? This is a thought process that you can go through internally. Uh, we'd also be more than happy to speak with you uh, from the account management level around how this might function within your platform. Um, but of course, following that, set up a cadence with the, with the, uh, the, the community admins, uh, the group admins. Uh, check in with them. Uh, make sure that feedback loop is consistent. Um, and one way that we've seen uh, prove really successful is by creating a group for your group admins where they can share best practices and communicate with one another. Um, so I know there's, there's quite a lot to digest here. And as I mentioned, we're gonna follow up uh, with some documentation on how to identify group admins or champions or advocates, whatever you'd like to call them. Uh, so you'll be receiving a, a full white paper uh, and, and canvas to help scope out your project plan following the webinar today. Now, two last slides, some of you may have seen these before, but I, I really want to, to, to stress the fact that building a content and engagement strategy is really critical. Communities are living and breathing organisms. They evolve and change over time. They're constantly growing. So it's not a set and forget kind of principle. You don't just create the community uh, and if you build it, they will come. Uh, in fact, initially, it's very much a top-down, uh, top-driven uh, content strategy. Uh, so you as a community admin are gonna have to create the content, create the posts, get those users into the platform and communicating with one another. Um, but this, the strategy of identifying and leveraging champions or group admins is actually a great way to uh, kind of exponentially grow the amount of community managers you have at your disposal. Um, they can communicate with members. Uh, they can start, uh, you can start offloading some of the content creation uh, and the activity that you want to generate onto those champions uh, as they have rights and permissions within the platform as well. And then what you'll see is slowly um, moving forward uh, that this will start to this, this will start to actually trickle down all the way to the, the grassroots. Uh, so again, starting at the top, moving into the group admin phase, there will be a, a critical mass of end users who feel comfortable, confident, they can identify with individuals uh, inside of the community are gonna be more willing to contribute. They need that guidance up front, but once they've kind of feel like they're at home, uh, they're, they're gonna be contributing uh, to, to the community themselves. And, and ultimately that will turn into a sort of a balanced output between uh, top-down content creation uh, and, and grassroots initiatives from your uh, members within the community. So uh, I just wanted to stress that one more time. Again, there will be a documentation sent over that you can uh, flip through and see how that might apply uh, to your community. But um, without further ado, I'd really like to hand it over to Rob Ellis from Fulbrighter. Uh, again, a, an exemplary uh, use case. Uh, he's been a phenomenal partner to work with. Uh, we're really excited about the early success of his community on Fulbrighter and uh, excited to share it with you all today and hopefully it'll be an inspiring uh, step in the right direction. Thank you for that, Carl. I'll try to live up to that introduction. Um, I am going to share my screen now just to talk through a couple of slides with you. So I think it's really exciting the steps that Hybright are taking to move into the sphere of thought leadership to provide more strategic guidance on such topics as managing group admins. I think it's a necessary and very welcome development. I will stress at this point that I am not a thought leader. Um, it's been many, many years since I had an original thought. I am more a practical press buttons and see what happens. So I've been managing digital and real life communities for about a decade now. And during that time, I've done some sensible things and I've done some very stupid things. But through doing that, 
I've got a basic sense of what works well and what doesn't work well. And in the next sort of 10 to 15 minutes, I want to give a guide to some of the practical strategies we've put in place with the Fulcrowetta platform to best help us to manage our group communities. So just to begin with summarising what Fulbright is, for those of you that may not know, Fulbright is a cultural exchange programme between the United States and around 200 other countries around the world. It is a programme that involves students, scholars, but also professionals, and it is a two-way exchange. So people go from the US to other countries and from other countries to the US. There's around 300,000 Fulbright alumni and they seem to get everywhere. I think I saw earlier in the chat that we have Samar, one of our uh, attendees of, the, of this session, is actually a Fulbrighter um, themselves. So you'll see that the reach of Fulbrighters is quite immense. But previously, there's been no way to bring this community of Fulbrighters together, to allow them to exchange ideas, offer support to each other, collaborate on projects, and to collaborate on research. So Fulbrighter was designed to essentially meet this gap, to provide a space where all these grantees and alumni from across the world could come together. Now we launched a platform um, just under six weeks ago. So it's still very early days, but we are having some success and some challenges, which I can talk through now. I think one thing to stress initially, when you're working with group admins, it is very helpful if you have a vision and mission for your platform that you can easily capture in a single slide or in a single couple of um, sentences. That will help you have an emotional connection with everyone having an administrative role in your platform because everyone will be brought into a shared vision. For Fulbrighter, we really wanted to make sure that it was a ground up platform it was a platform meeting the needs of alumni and grantees. So it was not about providing administrative support to countries or to the US State Department. It was about being a platform that alumni and grantees valued and made themselves take ownership of. As such, it was really important that we could empower alumni to take on strategic leadership roles within the platform. Now, I'm not going to read out the vision and mission statements. You can see them on your slide now. But I think the last point under mission is crucial for us. It is about making sure that we can inspire collaboration and the sharing of ideas, knowledge, best practice and advice amongst the Fulbright community. I am going to go on in a moment to just show you our live platform so you can get a sense of um, what it's looking like. Someone has asked a question in the Q&A about how many members the Fulbright community has. So there are currently six and a half thousand people signed up to the platform. We've been live for about six weeks and it's still being fairly um, low key promotion wise. Uh, we'll be doing more promotion over the coming months. So I will jump into the platform in a moment, but I want to very quickly summarize the structure of our platform to show you where our group admins fit in. We have a global community. That is what I manage. It is the space in the platform that all members are part of. So it is that live feed, the main directory, main news and events. Within that, we have a range of organizations around the world that have their own sub-communities. So the way Fulbright is administered is each country essentially has their own administrative team supporting that country's grantees and alumni. So then we have a band, what we call the tier two band of organizational communities they each get their own group within the platform. So there's a group for the US UK Commission, a group for the French Commission, etc., etc. And each of them has their own group admins, but those are group admins that are part of um, a formal organizational team. But then it's the tier three communities that are most important to talk about today. These are what we want to be our user led communities. And we want them themed around specific regions Scandinavia, London, Paris specific intellectual disciplines, environmental research, cancer research, or specific professions, lawyers, teachers, etc. And it's this group of user-led communities we specifically worked on 
empowering in the platform. As promised, I do now want to switch into thinking about the platform itself. I think that's the best way of getting a sense of it. So this is the full writer platform in front of you. And I'm just gonna talk through some of the strategies we've implemented to empower our group admins. So what I will say at this point is we have around about 100 admins in the platform already. I suspect that is on the higher end um, that what most of you experience in your own jobs. I'd also say that I am a 100% community manager. That is my dedicated role. Um, so I work with this platform um, all the time. I suspect many of you watching the webinar will have conflicting priorities. You might be alumni managers working on events, fundraising and community management. You might have broader communications roles. So I appreciate that you may not have the same resource and time as I have. So what I'm going to talk about in the next little bit is just essentially a layered way of thinking about some strategies you can implement, regardless of whether you've got all the time in the world on your hands or whether you're pushed for time. And I'm really going to focus on three areas which kind of pick up from what Kyle was talking about earlier. Area one is about identifying and acquiring group admins. Area two is about training and development. And then area three is about reward. So to turn initially to that question of acquiring and identifying um, group admins. I would say that there are two main recommendations I would have for you to help you recruit group admins. One is to increase your visibility in the platform. So this was something I spent a lot of time prior to launch thinking about, whether I would have my name on everything, whether I'd have my face visible across the platform. And I did make the decision that I would sign off emails personally. I would have a personal account in the platform that people could see and visit to ensure that I had a certain amount of visibility in the platform. The rationale for this is from my experience of digital and analog communities, you're more likely to get engagement and you're more likely to get support if people have some sort of emotional identification with you. If people know who you are, what you look like, what your tone is. If you're just an anonymous voice, if you're an Alexa, if you're a Siri, it's gonna be very difficult to get the sort of engagement you want from people because they won't have that emotional identification with you. So yes, I do sign emails with my own name, my own email address. I also try and be human when I'm posting on the platform. So to give you an example, here you can see our Fulbrighter platform on the screen in front of you, and I'm showing you a post from our live feed. This is a post from a new Fulbright grantee. She's just arrived in Spain, and she's posted a very lovely message. She's posted a picture and said, she's on the way home from orientation. Thank you to the commission and all of our distinguished guests for having us. You might want to think about how you personally would reply to a post like that. I try and keep my posts fairly light and fairly human. So I saw that picture and I replied with, um, did you steal Fulbright Spain sign? Now, now I'm saying that in front of a group of 80 people. I'm not going to claim that some example of shining wit. I'm not saying it's the funniest thing you've ever seen. But the idea is it's a comment that's designed to make people identify with me understand who I am and have some human normal conversation in the platform and I think it worked quite well that comment got some likes and it got some other people responding to it and crucially it's brought a relationship between me and this grantee so where I ask this grantee for help when I try and nominate her for um, advanced uh, activities she at least knows who I am and knows where I'm coming from I think that's probably better than either being some sort of automated posting machine where you're just churning out news story, news story, news story without a personal touch. I think it's also better than just posts that say, thanks for sharing, that was really interesting, because they don't encourage that sort of engagement with your users that I think is important. So yeah, increase your visibility within the platform. Make sure people know who you are. So when you're trying to recruit people, when you send out those emails saying, would you like to be one of our um, group admins? They know who you are, they have that relationship with you. That's a very active way of thinking about the acquisition and identification 
of group admins. There is also a more passive way. And I would recommend that you all set aside a space within your platforms to talk about how users can get involved. So we have a quite thorough about Fulbrighter section in our website that provides a user guide, FAQs, a privacy notice, but it also has a get involved section. And this is where if users want to apply to have a group created, they can download a form. If they want to suggest improvements to the platform, they can contribute to our roadmap. And also crucially, they've got the option of volunteering for one of our leadership roles, which is what we call being a group admin. Now, what we found is we haven't had a huge number of people clicking on this option and contacting me to be one of our group admins. We've had about seven since the platform launched. That's seven out of six and a half thousand users. So it's not been a huge number, but all of those seven people who have contacted me are very switched on, very engaged. They've read all about the Fulbrighter platform. They understand what its mission is, what it stands for, and they're already very well equipped to take on the role of a group admin. And so what this has been for me, certainly, it's been a massive time-saving measure um, to allow users to read this information on the platform, understand the mission, and come to me with fully formed ideas of what they want the group to be um, and uh, how they want to develop that group. I am seeing some more questions come in specifically about this. Um, I think I'll pick up some of those at the end of the session rather than keep breaking off um, to answer those as we go. And what's really great about this is this is a passive investment of time. You spend a bit of time before you launch the platform creating the Get Involved page, and then you can just direct people to it. If people have queries about how to get involved, you direct people to it. So in the long term, it takes away from those extended email exchanges you might have with people about how to become a group admin. So that's a couple of tips on acquisition. Make yourself visible and have some form of formal get involved page to encourage people to take part in the platform. So I think the next area I want to turn to is around training and development. Now, Kyle slightly preempted this earlier when he mentioned you should have an area in your platform for group admins. I, I would strongly reiterate this. So we have our communities tab at the top. Our communities tab is equivalent to the groups tab that you might have in your Hybrite platform. And one of our communities is what we called the admin area. And what this admin area provides is a space for all our admins. So we have about 100 in them in there to find training and support materials. So we have a support and guidance section, which has the user guide, back office guide, information on data protection, information about communication strategies, including logos, all that sort of information. But it also has the forum, the live feed that people can use to develop a community of practice, really. People can share best practice, people can ask each other ideas, and you're devolving that authority to your admins to take control of this space. And this was very simple to set up. It's just another group in the platform. You make it a private group and add your users to it. Kyle also mentioned about the training regime. We have rolled out a fairly significant training regime to all users. This has included live webinars with me, recorded webinars on data protection and getting started in the platform, and our own version of the user manual. From feedback from those sessions, I would say the most important thing is not necessarily technical instruction, so not so telling people how to do things in the platform, what buttons to press, um, what options to select. It's more about translating the core Hybrite function and saying how your local version of Hybrite uses that function. So how do you want people to use the groups tool? What titling conventions do you want people to use? Which of the features that Hybrite offers do you particularly recommend people using? Do you want to say people should be using the forum for questions or the live feed? So it's not about technical instruction. You can leave that to Hybrite's back office. It's about thinking about how your own version of Hybrite will work and making sure all your admins um, get on that and understand that. 
A lot of our support materials are available on our site, even if you're not logged in. So if you visit our site at any point, you can see a lot of this information yourselves um, and read up on it. So I think that's acquisition training development coming very quickly. So I want to close by talking a little bit about perhaps the most contentious um, topic, which is about reward. How do you make it worth it for group admins to volunteer, to engage and to spend the time um, dedicated to building up the platform and supporting you in your role? So I would say a couple of things. Going back to my About Fulbrighter Get Involved section, we've given, we don't use the term group admins. At the risk of Rob and Carl shouting at me earlier, I don't think the term group admin is a particularly valuable term. It's quite a techie term, and it's not a term that anyone wants to put on their CV, for example. We've had branded roles that people can take up. So we've talked about things like community lead, community managers, content leads. You might want to think about whatever sphere you work in, whatever professional discipline you're in, whether you're in academia, what sort of role titles would encourage people to volunteer to be a group admin. So it might be things like editor, commissioning editor, community manager, content strategist. Giving them a name, giving them a value in the platform will make them feel rewarded and it gives them that transferable experience that they can use on CVs in other contexts to indicate to other people the sets of skills that they've acquired. But I'd also say in addition to honoring them with role titles, I think you should also make sure they're invested in the success of the platform. So to go back to my admin area, I showed earlier the support and guidance tab. We've also got an evaluation and development tab. And this is a tab where really we lay ourselves bare to our admin communities. We let them into the strategic workings of the platform. So they can see in detail the roadmap we've agreed with Hybright of what developments are gonna come and how they can get involved in testing those. We let them see the minutes of our advisory board who sets the strategic policies for the platform. We also give them their very own analytics dashboard, which they can use to get strategic insights into the platform. And this again makes them feel like by making them a group admin, you're not just asking them to do some operational tasks within the platform, you're giving them a major stake in the platform's strategic future and strategic development. Just to show you what that analytic dashboard looks like and why we've done that, um, I just need to share another aspect of my screen. So this is the analytics dashboard. It's basically the same analytics that you can get in the back office of Hybright, but those analytics aren't broken down by group. So this dashboard has very similar charts that you're familiar with, user activations by date, activated versus unactivated, city versus country, cohort year. But rather than it being global, group admins have the option through this box on the right to filter by their specific group. So the group admin in Fulbright Australia can click Fulbright Australia, all the charts on this page update, and they can get their strategic insight into the platform. And again, by doing this, you're making them feel like a valued stakeholder that is getting access to things that a normal user of the platform does not have. The last topic I very quickly turn to under reward is the question of financial reward. And I think that's a topic that comes up very frequently in these sort of discussions. We currently do not offer any financial incentive to users to become a group admin. That's not something we've done since launch and we don't have plans to. We do plan to create some posts as senior group admins essentially, perhaps three or four, that will be paid, but that payment is primarily designed to professionalize those roles, to formalize hours they might undertake for this role, to formalize exact deliverables we expect from them. So it's not an incentive, it's just about professionalizing that role. I would say from my experience, uh, that's the more appropriate approach. I think trying to use money to incentivize people to come, become group admins has not typically worked in my experience. It doesn't bring the quality of engagement you might want to have.
but using limited pots of money to try and professionalize that role and try and bring a formal contract or not a formal contract but an informal contract into play um, I think is uh, the wiser approach. So that was very much a whistle stop tour of some of the work we've done as part of the Fulbrighter community. It is very early days we're still learning and I'd welcome any feedback and comments in the Q&A or by email afterwards but I think to summarize I've taken you through those three key phases acquisition training and development reward and you should see through that there are some very achievable things I've mentioned so for example creating a get involved page you don't need to worry about smart CSS you don't need to worry about nice styling just a page where you express your vision that's enough and that could take 30 minutes and that will save you a long time in the future but also there's some more advanced things you could think about recording training videos thinking more about how to style your platform investing in developing your own analytics dashboard um, and that will very much depend on the amount of resource at your end and your commitment to being group admins i think i'll pause there but i think that leaves us about 15 minutes for questions answers and discussion yeah that was fantastic rob thank you so much for sharing uh amazing presentation uh great to see some of the thought process that you took uh putting in uh to to launching your platform but uh also the final product i think is a testament to the amount of work and, and effort uh that, that you put in up front uh and i know uh firsthand because i, I spent uh you know several uh several weeks several months uh with you and and uh kind of collecting feedback from you and and uh so again, an amazing process. I think one that uh, all of our customers can learn from and, and model up. Um, I did see quite a few questions come in. Uh, so perhaps we can choose a, a few choice questions that are relevant uh, specifically to uh, you and the Ful Fulbrighter program. Um, one, one thing that uh, I think stood out uh, to most people was the Get Involved page. So um, I, I know you kind of talked about it at length, but perhaps you could just reiterate your initial thought process behind it and then maybe touch briefly on the technical aspects of setting it up. I know that you added some, uh, you know, you, you use some kind of advanced uh, techniques to get, uh, achieve what you achieved, um, but there might be alternative routes within the platform to accomplish a similar goal. Yep, so I think there's two, there's two aspects thinking about the Get Involved page. There's the, the shiny look and feel, which I want to put aside to one second. I think the first thing is the content. I spent a lot more time thinking about the content of that section than I did about the style. It's about thinking about how much you're prepared to share, how much you're prepared to open up the workings of the platform to these users, um, and thinking about how you want to pitch it to your specific alumni and grantee community in terms of tone and in terms of what actually you think the key call to actions are. What actual involvement do you want? Do you want them to be able to request to create a group. Is that piece of functionality you want? Or are you more interested in you centrally determining what group should exist and then finding the admins to run those groups? So that comes back to you thinking about what your content and community strategy are before you can filter that into the Get Involved page. So I would say that is really the most crucial stage of it. You to think strategically around exactly how you want to empower people to be involved. What are the limits of that involvement and how you want to express it? My background is partly in web development and my view is a slightly flashy web page can actually help you help users to navigate some detailed information um, quite cleverly. So I am, as you may have noticed already, I'm a bit of a waffler. I, I, I talk a lot, I write a lot, I'm very, very wordy. One thing I like websites to do is kind of take my wordy nonsense and break it down into just a very series of very small bullet points and call to action buttons. And that's essentially what we did with the Get Involved page. It's all simple CSS. There's no, there's no cleverness going on. It's, it's, if you've done CSS training, it's, it's just that. It's making sure that it works on PC and mobile is the crucial aspect, but it's not advanced CSS. If anyone wants to talk to me afterwards about what I'm done, um, I'm very happy to share um, some of the tips, but it's essentially just a series of uh, triple divs um, and class names um, set up to present the page in a vaguely flash way. 
Fantastic. I, I have uh, another question. This one isn't directly from the question box, but I, I think it, it's it's pertinent for, for everyone here. So uh, one of the first times we met, Rob, uh, you mentioned that, and, and you mentioned on the call today, is that um, you're a, a full-time dedicated community manager. And what I've encountered as I've spent more and more time with our customers is that uh, there's all different types of individuals that actually take ownership of the hybrid platform. Sometimes they're in marketing, sometimes they're in content creation, sometimes they're on the kind of the developer IT side. Uh, in your case, you're, you're a, a full-time community manager, which I think is uh, not necessarily unique, um, but especially with the, the scope and scale of your platform, uh, there are inherent challenges with that. And one thing that really stood out to me in, in one of our conversations is that, you know, Hivebrite is, is kind of 20% of your day-to-day. 80% -day. of it goes into kind of the, the thought process, the philosophy, um, you know, the design thinking around what you're trying to accomplish, and then you map that back uh, to the areas of Hivebrite that it suits you best. Um, so I, 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 not a specific question there, but I'd really love to hear uh, some more around kind of how you frame uh, your role as a community manager, how these group admins or advocates or champions or whatever kind of terminology you want to use uh, will help you and are, are currently helping you in, in, in developing uh, such a substantial online community? So that's a very good question. And so I think to share my background, I was a long time ago an academic myself, um, and I did a lot of teaching of undergraduates. And I found that teaching, lecturing to a group of 200 18 year olds on a Tuesday morning, telling them all about medieval literature was a challenge. And the only way you can overcome that challenge is to build communities within the classroom. Think about strategies of how you get um, people to a shared level of expectation and a shared emotional involvement with you. And in being a teacher, you have various tools that you employ to build those communities. Those tools are your own body as a performative space in front of a classroom. They are PowerPoint slides. But they're also thinking about the dynamics of your classroom, knowing which students are particularly vocal, which ones you have to keep quieter, which ones you encourage to speak more loudly, where the key ideas are coming from in the classroom and how those dynamics work. And I found when I transitioned from academia into a career in marketing and digital community management, it was that experience of being a teacher that has proved most useful in thinking about how to address and guide users in your community and to me i do place the effort emphasis more on community than on hybrid i very much enjoy working with hybrid i think it's a very sophisticated tool but ultimately it is just a tool in my wider arsenal of things i use to build a community as i mentioned in the presentation i am part of that tool the way i present myself in the platform the way we use group admins the way we use hybrid they're all strands of a wider strategy for building a successful community so i think i think companies like hybrid can occasionally assume that people are dedicated 100 percent to being a hybrid administrator we're not in the same way that many of you wouldn't ever call yourself a facebook administrator or a twitter administrator even though you spend a lot of time with those platforms so i think recognizing that the platform is a tool to support your strategy is the crucial element don't let the tool drive the strategy yeah, I think that's a fantastic philosophy. And again, it, it resonated with me when we first spoke and I, I'm, I'm glad we were able to share it today. Um, one, one other question uh, that I think would be interesting for, for everyone on the call is uh, around uh, essentially how you interact long-term with the group admins. Um, so I know that early on you had a series of webinars to do some of the training, acquisition, talk about data protection, familiarize them with the platform. Uh, you clearly set up uh, channels within uh, the, the hybrid platform for them to collect feedback for individuals to uh, raise their hand essentially and say they're willing to participate. Um, how do you envision the long term kind of feedback loop with these group admins, especially as you expand beyond 6,000 to 10,000 to potentially 100,000 users inside of the platform? Yep. So I don't have the perfect answer to that yet. It's still something we're working on. I think because we've recently launched a platform about six weeks ago, my role is currently very operational. I'm doing a lot of sitting in the platform, clicking buttons. And I suspect many of you watching this webinar will be familiar with that sense. You have very, very bold, exciting strategic plans for how to enhance your communities, but then you end up just spending half your day responding to emails, 
the rest of the day dealing with data protection issues, uploading data, and you don't ever get to be that strategic visionary that your job asks of you and that you'd love to do. So partly, we want to be using group admins to take away some of that operational stuff from me so I can do more in the way of strategic leadership. So we're looking at doing some updated webinars for our group admins on best practice in the platform. We'll also shortly be doing a survey of group admins and users to capture some of the initial thoughts on the platform, things that have worked well, things that have worked less well, as a way of beginning to think about what the feedback loop is of people giving ideas to us and us implementing them. So yeah, I think we've got more to think about there, Carl, but that's the current standing. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I uh, had one last question here, and, and I think uh, the, the slides that you, you shared with us earlier really go through uh, essentially the, the, the global hierarchy of, uh, of the platform. And anybody, uh, and I would imagine most people who've been on the, 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 the webinar today, probably went through an onboarding process where we talked about uh, essentially the architecture of the Hivebright platform, uh, how different uh, access rights or clusters or permissions have an impact on what an individual can do within the community and then conceptually uh, how that you know has an impact on end user experience. Um, you uh, clearly put together a, a hierarchy that uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think one that's well thought out and has proven to be fr fruitful in the early phase of your launch period. Um, based on my experience with you, I know that we've done some kind of design thinking exercises together uh, to start to, to formulate uh, or articulate what we're, we're trying to do. Um, I was curious, uh, do you have any best practices or perhaps from your teaching days, uh, ways to kind of put your ideas onto paper uh, for those who might uh, be doing this for the first time or uh, are intimidated uh, by the idea of, of trying to, to build out um, kind of that, that, uh, that infographic that you had that, that really maps uh, your vision uh, to the high Fred platform. So I have in front of me an A3 notebook, which has hundreds of very scrappy, very bad drawings I've produced over the last six months of just ideas I've had. And actually a lot of that was the first month or two months I was joining on this project. So I would have days where I'd turn my email off and I'd go and sit in a local park for an hour and a half, two hours, and just think about a topic. So I'd think about data flows. And I'd work out all the flows just in that notebook, just scrappily noting things down. I think about data flows. I think about what is compulsory information we collect, what is optional information. I think about what access rights admins would need to have. I thought about the approval process. And I, I cannot stress enough. I know this is going to be sounding, I'm going to make it sound easier than it is. But taking an hour away from emails, away from your telephone, to allow yourself a bit of strategic thinking, I think is crucial. I, I know it is very difficult. I know we all wedded to our computer screens, um, but just having that space away from the operational day to day to think long term is crucial. And you'll know the best way of working. For me, it was visual. For me, it was a pen on a paper, scrambling down notes. For you, it might be a Trello board. It might be a project management solution. It might be a Word document where you just note down your ideas. You'll know the best way, but it's about freeing up your head for some thinking space. Um, which is very easy to say, very difficult to do. That's some, that's some good advice. I, I think uh, it, it's somewhat ironic that a, a digital community manager suggests walking away from the computer, <laughs> but uh, I, think, I think that's actually just a testament to the, the, the day and age we live in. Um, well, I, I know we've only got a couple more minutes here. There's a lot of questions coming in. Um, I, I think uh, what I'd, I'd really like to do um, well, if, if, if you don't mind, if we could run over uh, maybe a minute or so, um, I, I see a couple more questions around engaging your users to activate their accounts. So I think this is a, a topic that comes up fairly often. We've got a huge database. Uh, we've been starting to send out communications to drive people to the platform. As you mentioned before, uh, it's been a little bit under the radar with uh, Fulbrighter as of yet, but that will slowly ramp up. Um, do you have any ideas or kind of have you thought conceptually around what the best way to drive people into the community uh, and actually convert them into uh, long-term and, and kind of lifelong members of the community will be? So I think a couple of things I'd say in response to that. Um, one is because of our data protection regime, we've said that where user data is in the platform for unactivated users, it can only be there for six weeks. 
We're not going to be storing data in the platform with unactivated users um, in perpetuity. We don't think that's appropriate for data protection. That's allowed us to schedule a communications campaign of emails um, of a fortnightly basis, ask people to activate their account. And then we sent an email about five days before their account is due to expire saying, if you don't access your account now, all your data will be deleted. And actually that's been one of the most successful campaigns we've done because we put a deadline on them doing things. We've put a bit of oomph behind it and say, if you don't act now, um, your data will be deleted. Now, obviously they can, they can register again in the future if they like, but that's been a way of perking them up and inspiring them to get in the platform. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would recommend is we have spent quite a bit of time developing promotional materials for the platform, which include things as simple as email templates that colleagues in countries, colleagues in the US government can use to promote the platform. This has been really helpful because it means everyone is using the same language, the same terminology in their messages. And it means we can encourage local contacts to contact their communities. So going back to what I said earlier about my own visibility in the platform, if you're not visible in the platform, think about who is. Think about who are the influencers on the people you want to get into the platform and get those influencers to invite them rather than doing everything through yourself or through an anonymous admin in the platform. The more people they identify with and have an emotional connection with, um, engage with them, encourage them to use the platform, the better. And in terms of long-term engagement, that is a struggle for us. It's early days. We're trying to put more work into this now. Our particular focus is on securing robust, engaging content that we can send out through newsletters to encourage people to keep re-engaging with the platform. But that's very much a work in progress um, for us at our end. Fantastic. Well, I, I think we've uh, just crossed over the, uh, the hour. Um, so again, I really want to extend my thanks to Rob Ellis from Fulbrighter for joining us today. Uh, again, great partner, uh, very insightful, and hopefully today was an inspiration uh, to all the attendees on the webinar. Um, we are going to leave the webinar open in the next 10 minutes or so. So feel free to put your questions in. If you don't get an immediate response, I'm going to copy and paste these questions and do my best to disseminate uh, the answers in the follow-up. Um, and again, uh, if you have any direct questions around the webinar, the content, uh, anything to do with today's session, feel free to email me directly, kyle at hivebright.com, uh, and we'll figure out a way to get uh, the right people in touch uh, with, uh, with the right people, essentially. Um, so thank you so much for attending the webinar. Uh, we are really excited that we had such a high turnout rate. We're looking forward to this in the future. Uh, so again, when you close out, uh, feel free to take that um, survey and give us some feedback and we will incorporate that into our next session. So Rob and Rob, thanks so much for joining and everyone on the line. Uh, we appreciate your time and look forward to speaking with you soon. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, so. Talk soon.